What's up, everybody? Welcome back to another solo episode with just me, Roggle. No signal late at night, just me. So you're gonna have to sit here and listen to me talk to myself for the entire, however long we go for, I have no idea. Um, one thing I wanted to do, I think we may do it across the board, uh, being our third season, it's kind of dabble into our background a little bit. Um, kind of let you guys in a little bit to know kind of who we are, where we grew up, kind of just the background a little bit more. I know we've dabbled on a little bit in the past um, with our military and our daily dad life and stuff like that. But uh, one thing we do really enjoy is, you know, obviously getting together and talking, but uh, you don't really get to know too much of our background. Um, so I'm not going to get too crazy in depth with everything, but uh, one thing I do, I do want to talk about, which is kind of the, you know, background of everything and just introduce myself a little bit more in depth than I have kind of on, on the podcast. I know we've dabbled into military life, dad life, uh, work life, you know, I'm the only one that works out of the other two. Um, and you know, the balance that we have to bring with the podcast and starting another podcast. So, I mean, it, it does get difficult for myself to balance all that. Um, I won't speak on how the other guys handle their stuff because I know to each their own and each one is different how they handle their stuff. Um, I do struggle at times with it. Uh, my, my time management is very poor at times because I do tend to co uh, commit a lot of my time to my family because I, you know, I, I want to commit my time to that because that's one of the most things that are important to me in my life. Um, and then obviously the podcast and just content creating as I can. Obviously you don't see a lot of content from me. That's basically because I, I tend to put more time on my family, but growing up, um, had a very strong family base, you know, grew up with a younger sister, parents in the house, something like that. Um, normal childhood, nothing crazy, nothing bad. Uh, wasn't until I like, graduated high school and then decided to move to Iowa. Grew up in grew up in Iowa, running my or moved my moved to Iowa in my twenties and then started there working working with juveniles and things like that, really getting into that because that's the path I wanted to take take as a social worker. But kind of find out there's no money in that, and that was kind of more of a dead end job because it wasn't, it wasn't paying the bills. It was getting things done, so decided to uh, go ahead and just join the military, and was not the worst decision of my life. At times, I thought it was probably the worst decision, but joined in 2007 and went in obviously after you know 9/11 and all like that. Um, that was a that was a crazy time of going in at that point. And, because uh, I think it was 20, was it 24 at the time, so a little bit older than a lot of people tend to join, but obviously there's multiple ages that people join. Um, but yeah, I joined the Army National Guard here in Iowa, um, went through all that basic training in Fort Benning, Georgia. Really enjoyed that. It sucked at times, but um, I decided to go during the summer because I, I can't do winter time. I hate being cold, and obviously I'm complaining because I live in Iowa, and we're one of the worst states to complain about. Obviously, being Midwest, you get all four seasons, and it, it does suck. But going to Fort Benning, Georgia was a, an amazing experience. Uh, went there for 11 Bravo, 11 Charlie. Uh, my base, my main MOS was 11 Charlie, Mortarman. So many people don't know what that is or anything like that. But basically, you just drop, you drop projectiles into a tube, and it shoots out. If you play like I do, Warzone, you know, things like that, you have mortar strikes, and that's typically what it was. Um, that we did. I also had a secondary MOS, was obviously was Love and Bravo. Um, got out of basic training, and within a year, I was deployed to Iraq with with my company, being National Guard. It was, you know, our one week in a month, two weeks a year, as they try to say, which is nowhere near that. But uh, deployed with the company, and within that first deployment, I met the amazing Lane, as you. Uh, as you may or may not have heard his voice or seen him on the podcast, uh, we became closer friends after Iraq because I gave him shit all the time that he didn't know, notice me or we didn't talk. We uh, we kind of went in different groups, and he'll talk about a lot of times about the people that I was with and um, how he didn't care for him. but that was where I was at, and I was strong where I was at. Um, stuff with the leadership that I had to get where I needed to be within my, my career as I looked at it at the time. Uh, being an E4 in Iraq, different times, definitely, uh, definitely crazy. 
culture shock for sure. I'd never been out of the out of the U.S. I think I took my first plane ride. I was 16 years old uh, to Las Vegas of all places with my with my grandparents, which is a very odd. Uh, no, I think it was 14 actually. Uh, a very odd trip because you're going to Vegas with your grandparents, and obviously at that time, um, streets were littered with, you know. Uh, scaly clad women, pictures of people trying to get you to pull you into the clubs and things like that, and seeing a lot of stuff everywhere. Obviously, it's nothing new that I'd seen at the time, but walking with your grandparents, it's very, very awkward. Um, but going over to Iraq, being able to see, stopping in Germany, stopping in just those those smaller countries, Kuwait, to transit to acclimate yourself and transition to everything. But before we even got over there, I went to Mississippi to uh, to train up and do everything like that. And that was a whole other experience as well because Mississippi weather sucked. I hated it, never liked it, and never will go back to it if I don't ever have to. Um, you can go take a shower and walk outside and you're sweating because it's so humid outside. Um, crazy place to train. Um, we had, don't get me wrong, we had great training, but it was, uh, it was difficult at times because the heat, you obviously did acclimate to it. But uh, in my opinion, Iraq was no worse than, you know, than Texas. Uh, and even at times, you know, the Midwest in general, um, just because the way that the, the weather was, even when we were there, it did snow one time, which they hadn't seen snow in a very long time. But um, being in Iraq in my, in my mid-20s, um, I obviously had uh, an experience with, I was obviously, I was married at the time as well. Um, so I had that experience of, you know, money coming in, not the most money by any means. Obviously, you can make a lot more money working at McDonald's than you can being an E4 uh, deployed. You're not going to make the most money, but you will You will make enough money to support yourself because there's nothing over to really spend it on unless you're going to buy a bunch of stupid stuff. Um, and trust me, there's plenty of stupid things to buy while you're deployed from a car, motorcycle, and anything else you can think of. Um, so I said the basic needs while I was over there, and I, I enjoyed it. Um, did combat missions. I was a gunner and a driver. I was a 50 cal gunner and drove the up armor Humvees. Um, an amazing time to do that. Um, scared shitless when I was a gunner. You know, didn't really know what I was doing going into it. Trained up on the 50 cal, and once I was once I was proficient with the weapon, I was perfectly fine up there. I really enjoyed it. Um, driving was one of the funner things too, driving around Baghdad uh, through the cities and getting to experience obviously a huge culture shock of other languages, um, meaning Arabic and things like that. Uh, and then doing foot patrols throughout the city of Baghdad and seeing, we were within the Biop, so we were close to the Biop, but we did patrols outside of that area also. Uh, Biop is the Bag Baghdad International Airport. Um, we did foot patrols there, and one of the cooler things that I had, I, was, I grew up playing soccer, and being able to go over there and played, played soccer with some of the kids, some of the Iraqi kids with, that were out there in the streets, um, playing around, kind of having fun, you know, letting your guard down a little bit, but also having people around watch for you. You are not becoming too complacent to where, you know, you're going to be picked off by snipers and things like that, but it's not like we, we dropped, dropped gear and went out and played, you know, a 90-minute match by any means, but we did have, you know, a couple minutes here or there, we'd kick the ball back and forth and kind of joke around with them. But uh, at the same time, kids are kind of assholes at times, too. All they wanted was candy, you know, because that's, that's all the American troops would give them. They'd throw candy to them and try to keep them happy. But if they weren't getting what they wanted, they can get really mean. And that's one thing we had to deal with all the time was didn't give the kids what they wanted. They would throw rocks at you. They, they would pretty much act like little kids that weren't getting their way because, you know, they wanted their candy. But good experience all around. Um, some of the things that I did have one incident where I was walking out to a patrol one night and had my head down and <laughs> I walked into an electrical box. Probably one of the worst experiences of my life. One thing I probably never lived down and uh, I had to, I had to be rushed to the, uh, to the medic tent because I had, Busted my, I broke my over orbital bone within my left eye and had to, had to be taken there to check out and I couldn't open my eyes. I had a concussion and everything else. I was, I was walking pretty, pretty fast. I had my head up, head down and the corner of the, <laughs> the box had caught me 
right in the right in the eye, just in the right spot to break that bone. So I had to go to the green zone. If you uh, aren't familiar with that, that's where the cross sabers were and things like that. Uh, I, there's a movie out there also. I think it's a, I think it's Matt Damon that's in it, the green zone. But anyways, I had to go have surgery there on my eye and crazy times because obviously we're getting mortar all the time as well. And I'm thinking, okay, if I go under, which they're going to put me under to do the surgery, because I had, you know, fat and muscle tissue pinched down, so I couldn't even look up. Uh, if I get mortared while I'm asleep, I guess I'm not going to notice anything or feel anything, because I'm going to go out like that. But it is what it is. Once you're in there for so long, you get mortared so many times, you just kind of, well, if it's my time, it's my time. You get used to it. You kind of just, you just shake it off as a normal, normal day. Uh, but going through all that, down for a little while, I had stitches and everything in my face, and it was a different experience altogether. But one I will not, uh, not never forget being in Iraq. Uh, getting back, the transition um, from my from getting back to Iraq to um, well, just normal civilian life uh, is tough. So I, I know if you're if you're one of those guys that that are suffering with it and uh, trying to understand how to transition back into normal civilian life, it's tough. It always has been for many, many people. Um, I know I struggled at the first first time I did it, um, and man, it's, it's tough to get back from all that and come away from the freedom, because you have, you have nothing to do except your patrols. That's it, that's the only responsibility you have. Um, yes, many guys had, you know, I had a wife, and uh, I actually had a son that was born right before I deployed as well. Um, so I had a wife and kids back home, so I had, you know, responsibilities to go back to at that point. But when you go from having nothing to do but focus on yourself and the people and the guys around you, um, it's difficult to come back and focus on all that because that is your life at that point and you're in survival mode. Your training is, you know, you're trained, basically, I mean, you're trained to kill, trained to survive. And trying to turn that off is very difficult when you're doing it that nine to ten, ten months at a time with your, you know, three to four month train up. Um, you're in that, you're in that mode for so long and, you know, guys are struggling, they're coming back because we're looking for IEDs, the, you know, the explosive devices on the side of the roads and guys struggle coming back, you know, just driving. I know when I got back and I was driving, um, I came back on leave and I was driving, I was driving extremely slow. I was getting passed by cars and everything else on the, on the interstate. I was going 35 on the interstate. I was going even under 45. So thankfully, you know, I didn't have any problems that caused any wrecks like that, but I got looked at by my wife at the time, like, what are you doing? Why are you doing this? Like, well, I'm used to this. And I'm looking left and right. You know, obviously I have my, my son in the back, um, you know, so I have you no know, protection mode in my mind. Um, and it's hard to turn off. It's what a lot of people don't understand is that it is, it is very hard to turn off um, when that, you know, the fight or flight type, which you're, you're in that fight mode nonstop. Um, it's hard to turn off. It's very hard to turn off. Um, getting home and adapting back and seeing, you know, your family and, you know, everybody wants to hang out, have a good time. And, you know, you're, you want to have, you want to do it as well because you're excited. You're happy to be back. Um, but in the back of your mind, you know, if you're on leave, you know that you have people back, back overseas that are, you know, stuff can happen to them and that can freak somebody out um, because they're not there to help or protect if something does go wrong that sometimes they can feel responsible for it. Now, luckily that never happened with me um, within Iraq. So, you know, I, I came back and obviously I had, I had a lot of struggles, had a lot of different things happen. Um, so I did, did well and I, I did, I took, I went into and I, I did uh, therapy. I talked with the counselors, things like that. Um, I, I stayed in contact with a lot of the guys I was deployed with, and it does help because they come back, transition with the unit that I deployed with, and getting back to know those guys. And, you know, you have that time to go home, and then you come back, you know, to your, your one week in a month, as I like to call it, and meet with those guys, have that bond and everything, still be there. And then the guys that you are friends with, you talk to, randomly texting and calling, you know, just obviously off Facebook at the time too. So doing all that stuff, but then me trying to figure out what I was going to do, I tried to go back into social work and I wasn't, I wasn't, you know, feeling it at all. Um, I, it just wasn't something that I wanted to do anymore. And so I had a really hard time trying to figure out what I was going to do. And 
I had gone from working with juveniles, you know, 13 to 13 to 18. I transitioned to uh, to mental health or um, handicapped living, assisted living, pretty much as I had done. And I went, did that for a couple of years, and then I was employed again. Got employed to uh, Afghanistan in 2010. So I was home for a year and a half, in and in between there. I had different trainings and things too. So my home life really was not a, not a thing. I didn't have very much home life. Um, wasn't in my son's life very much. You know, my wife at the time, you know, we weren't, we weren't really having too much home life. I was, I was gone training. I was gone doing other things and trying to just have a normal life was difficult because, you know, you're balancing work, you're balancing military, you're balancing family, you know, your, your family, immediate family that you have right there with you. And then also your extended family, you know, your mom, your dad, your sister, and anybody else, you know, and just friends on top of that. It's sounds like, you know, it's a daily life, but at times if you're struggling with stuff, it's a lot to deal with. Um, but then in 2010, I was I was deployed to Iraq. Or no, <laughs> where I went to Afghanistan, and uh, this was a different different deployment. Um, the build up for this one, the training for this one was way different. Um, it was going to be looked at as a you know not a uh, not a security mission, which pretty much what Iraq was. Um, so we the train up was a lot. A lot uh, more difficult, a lot more stress. Uh, we did go back to Mississippi, which I hated. Um, went to California for ATC. You know, train up out there as well. Different uh, experience. It's Afghanistan is a little more mountainous, so trained up for that. Um, went out there. You know, obviously went to Kuwait. You know, I had like an acclimation there as well. Then went into Afghanistan, and man, it's a different world. The mountains are crazy, but in my opinion, it was. Again, more like Midwest um, weather. No, Iraq was hotter, obviously, but uh, Iraq or Afghanistan was more of a mountainous, obviously, but had not a crazy humid heat. It was balanced. Um, so going through all that, the the experience there was way different. We were set off in a cot by ourselves, not far from the Pakistan border. So living that life, you know, set out with just you know, one company and uh, support support company as well there of artillery. Um, you're surrounded by the entire uh, Afghan army is around, uh, but they're like an hour hour away. And then you have, you know, the Afghan police, which is down the road. And trying to understand who you're fighting at this point is difficult because they all look, you know, they don't dress in army fatigues. They dress in anything they can or want to, you know. You, so you don't know if the guy that's, you know, bringing up water for the day is, is the guy that's going to try and blow himself up or attack the base in any way or the cop at that point. Um, so you're always on guard, even with the uh, the guys that they come on who just do daily daily jobs and work out within the within the cop. Because we had local nationals that would come on and they, you know, they bring us bring us water because it was a job for them. We, we would pay them, you know, they had water trucks and things like that. They'd bring water and they'd take stuff down, you know, back and forth just to make a living for them because they saw us as a way to make money. But then also by Taliban, ISIS, what you all call them, uh, would find this out. They would recruit or tell somebody, hey, you go on and do this stuff or, you know, before I do something, you or your family. So we had guys come in and it got difficult at times, but I don't want to get too much into how how crazy all that stuff was, but that's just Afghanistan was a different uh, a different beast. Made a lot more friends in that one. Um, bringing in different, they kind of jammed different companies together because I like said a lot of different support teams. We had snipers, we had artillery, um, myself being mortar, and then also secondary eleven Bravo. So we had everybody within that. We had attack, uh, attached JTAC from the Air Force. Um, so we went on dip patrols, we had air support and everything else, and going up and down the, the mountains were crazy. Um, I did a lot more of the cop protection, so I did I did do patrols, but not as many as the other guys did. So I, I did see quite a few patrols outside the wire, but uh, I did a lot of other jobs within the cops, so it, uh, it got boring at times, but getting out and doing patrols, again, were, were pretty fun, and being able to 
position myself with some of the sniper teams and set up more systems outside on missions for support was really cool as well. Um, some of the scary stuff that we have, we obviously had to do our, I mean, you can call it broken arrow, what you want to say, but um, your final stand. So we had to get those points laid in on the mortar system. Pretty much you're, you're shooting straight up in the air, you're dropping, you're dropping stuff straight almost on top of you because you guys are getting danger close, so people coming in. So that was one of the things that really kind of messed with you. And being the second deployment, I handled it a little bit better. Uh, we had guys that it was their first deployment and kind of trying to teach them how to handle handle stress, handle different situations, you know, being away from their family. Some people, it's the first time they've ever been out of the country, like myself when I was in Iraq. Um, trying to get the get them to understand, you know, it's it's going to happen. You know, you're here, you're not going anywhere. Uh, understand that, you know, you, you stick with your training, you stick with everybody else, you know, you're, you're, you'll be fine. Um, obviously, freak accidents happen, things happen. You know, not everybody goes and comes back. It is what it is. You know, I'm not trying to be dark, just being honest. That's what. That's how it is. Um, I know Lane was also deployed to Afghanistan at the same time. I don't even know if we saw each other during that deployment because we were we were in different different cops. But uh, one thing I did enjoy. Um, also, we had the obviously the Iraq uh, play with the kids there, but also the food. The food was amazing that I that I always had when I was in Iraq, and also I had. Amazing food in Afghanistan. This is local food, not the stuff we get from the chow hall and everything else. This is a local food. The local nationals would make the food. Um, the bread is always great. We call it foot bread because obviously they would take their feet and smash it up and then throw it in a pretty much on coals uh, for almost it's like non bread, uh, typical with your Indian food and stuff like that. Just a non style bread. Um, and then I think the rice and goat, you know, it wasn't you know pig or beef that they would really do. Uh, so a lot of it was just goat, chicken. But uh, we did have one time where I was coming down because I, I would slept, I slept up on a, in a, a Connex box. It, it was about a 6 by 12 Connex box that I slept on top of a hill with a mortar system. And I was by myself, and obviously I just had HESCO barriers and barbed wire, or razor wire, we don't call it, around me. And I was up there by myself, so I, it took me a little bit to actually get to sleep at times because you know, get in my head of like I'm up here by myself if anybody comes over the wire right here it's just hopefully me and him and not me and his buddies but thankfully nothing like that ever happened I did have some guys um, walking around outside one night but uh, being able to go up there and separate and kind of enjoy the quiet and do my own thing um, I think it actually really helped me get through that deployment because I was able to really separate myself and be away from everybody and everything and take my peace and just just chill out. Because um, I was almost like I had my had my area where the mortar system was set up, the Connex area was set up, and it's like a house in a front yard and you're living in the mountains. Um, obviously, I had food I can go get and bring up whatever, but I had my whole room set up. Um, so I was able to really just do that, and I think that's one thing that I did take from that deployment of <laughs> making my introvert uh, worse <laughs> because, man, it was easy to just shut everything out and shut everybody out. Um, I had access to a sat phone as well, so I could call, you know, kind of whenever I needed to or wanted to, which was nice. Um, so I did that, but obviously, I, I, you know, I would guys would come up and talk to me, hang out, whatnot, but for the most part, I was, I was alone by myself up there but one day I was coming down and nobody was around it seemed like it was really quiet until I walked around the corner but I was walking walking down and saw nobody and I get in my head obviously I'm like I'm not seeing anybody in the towers I'm not seeing anybody anywhere so I walk around a corner and there's everybody after I had freaked out and thought that something had happened but I see a goat head on the ground and that trail of blood come to find out that the um, Afghan police had brought up a goat and they were going to make a whole meal for everybody so they brought up a couple goats and they were they had cut the head off and they skinned it and they were you know butchering it all right there in front of us which is really cool and probably some of the best goat i've ever had um but man it was a different experience walking around that corner after seeing nobody and seeing a goat head and then a trail of blood kind of freaked me out but you know at that point you'd seen so much um 
do that deployment, the, your shock factor is like, oh man. And then you're like, okay, well, not a big deal. It's a go-to-head, whatever. Um, but that's one big thing is uh, being able to get to that deployment really, really made me f figure out what I wanted to do with my military career. And um, at the time, my, my son at this time, he was probably, what was he? He was probably three years old, going on four. And I had been pretty much non-existent. I would say non-existent. I would say he's just in and out from training to everything else. Um, we obviously had time together, but I wanted to be around more. So when I got back, um, you know, the transition was, was difficult as well because I got divorced when I got back. And that was difficult, but um, thankfully I had, I had friends to help me deal with, with everything, with getting through everything. Because the biggest thing was not seeing my son. And not being able to see my son was really difficult to handle and not having him, him around daily, um, you know, it was it was really difficult. But I had I had good friends uh, that I ended up moving in with, and uh, I was deployed with at the time as well. So we were, we were close, and we really kind of helped each other just to get through everything. He was married as well, so thankfully him and his wife were very gracious in letting me move in. Pretty much reestablished my life, reset everything, and get through kind of what I was dealing with. Um, at that point, I had no idea what I was going to do because I was done with social work, wanted nothing else to do. Um, so what do I do? I decided to do commercial plumbing. And after, at this point, what do I have? Five, four, four years in military, two deployments. You know, I'm not old by any means, but my, my body had been beat up because I, all the weight that I put on my back is obviously like you've heard, I'm not the, top, not the biggest guy by any means, but I, um, the smaller guys always have something to prove and they always get shit on. So I was, I made it very known that, uh, I will, I will outwork anybody as long as it's, uh, as long as I'm alive. So that took a toll on my body. Um, commercial plumbing was not for me. I, again, like I said earlier, I hate the cold. And if you're working around steel pipes in the cold, your hands are freezing. And obviously there's water pressure testing and things like that. No, I was not going around plunging toilets and working at shit all day. I was actually put up putting up pipe. I was laying pipe all day is what I was doing. So cutting everything else. So yes, a great, great job to have. Um, just, I couldn't, I couldn't do the weather. So luckily I had a buddy. I was, uh, in, in my unit when I got, when we got back, um, they had a job that had an opening. It was in the AV. So audio video and anybody that knows that's even looked at it or thought about it or does it now, it's a very hard field to get into if you don't have any experience. But it's hard to get experience if you can't get a job doing it. So thankfully and luckily, a buddy of mine got me an interview with the, with the company. And obviously, I told him it was flat out. I, I don't have any experience. So going through the interview, I think I probably had one of the coolest bosses I think I've ever had. Um, he pretty much, we met at a bar and that was our interview. And pretty much we just drank and talked and he knew I was military so that helped as well. Um, but they gave me the chance to do it and I love this job. I've been doing this job for I think 10 years now. Um, and it's been great ever since. It's just, it was definitely scary because it's a whole new, whole new field that I never had any experience with. I knew I had a bus mask to get, get into it and if I wanted to succeed in it, I had to fully invest in it. And I have a, an issue when I fully invest in something, I tend to block everything out. So um, my uh, personal life as far as friends and family really struggled because I wanted this. The only one that I really focused on would be my son. And that was obviously every other weekend I had him. But every time I had him, it was I committed to that. Um, and I'm not saying that I did not have struggles with, you know, obviously military issues and things too, and just personal issues. I'm not gonna say I was, the, I was the worst at by any means, but there's struggles here and there. And anybody that knows anything about divorces and military life and everything too, uh, ex-wife was also in the military. So things were difficult, bouncing back and forth, trying to figure out schedules and everything else. And, and I was still, still young minded and didn't really focus on a whole lot, but I, you know, tried my best with everything with my son, but 
get into this into this job, I knew that it was going to be a job that was going to set me up for success uh, moving forward. And I wanted to make sure it worked out, so I busted my ass and I really got into it. Um, so yeah, I've been doing that job for 10 years. Feels like it's been about 20, but 10 plus years, right around 10 years, I'm not sure. Forever. Um, yeah, I've been doing audio video for a very long time. Um, and then also just after, just after, I know it's been 11 years. So just after starting that job, uh, I met my current girlfriend now, which we refer to as my wife. We've been together now almost 10 years as well. So we also have a daughter. She has a son um, as well. So, you know, we have a, we have a blended family and obviously anybody that knows blended families can be difficult, but um, thankfully when we met, I was on my last, I think my last year in my contract for military. I did nine years and I got out in 2000 and 2003, four, five, when the hell did I get out? No, I got in seven. No, I got in six. 2006, I got in. So, 2015, I got out. Did nine years. I didn't, if I didn't want to do the hump, because we hit that hump of 10 years, pretty much if you don't do your 20, then you're crazy. But I wanted to be around, so got out and tried to focus more on personal life. And, man, it was tough, because you cut that off from... Uh, the camaraderie of military guys and you just cut it to where you know it's it's easy to forget about the guy that's gone like you talk about like oh yeah give me a call we'll hang out we'll do this that well my my company was at this time two hours away because i had taken an e6 position two hours away from from where i live and it was very difficult because you have to focus on you know personal life here and also a company there but able to cut that cut that part out it was very tough i struggled with it because there's a lot of guys that i had and being a section leader at that time you know i had five guys underneath me because i had a whole fire team you know a mortar a mortar team within within that that i had to pretty much look out for and it was tough because that transition of trying to hand over responsibility to the incoming section sergeant and things like that it's it's tough but i did it and thankfully i think one thing that did help is uh, Lane ended up going to the same company, and that's where we kind of, uh, we were shocked when we found each other, but we realized that we were in the same company together, and it kind of made our transition there a lot easier because you're going from eastern, or western Iowa to eastern Iowa, and that's two different battalions, and they always obviously talk shit about each other, but it is what it is. You take your opportunities where you can, and uh, we both did. We both took our E6 over there. Um, met there and we we became a lot closer at that point. Uh, we really kind of leaned on each other for for just being there and talking and hanging out because we would hang out outside of drill um, on drill weekends. You know, we'd leave, we'd figure out what we're gonna do, you know, stuff like that. It was just it made it a lot easier. Obviously, we we're in different um, different MOSs. He was loving Bravo, I was loving Charlie. I could do the stuff he could do, but he couldn't do what I did. Lane's not smart enough to do what I did. Now, if you ask me now, I could not probably, I couldn't probably uh, lay in a mortar system now if I tried. But um, neither here nor there because I don't do not do that anymore. And yeah, I'd be shocked if I ever do it again. But uh, having him there made things a lot easier a lot, and a lot more fun as well. But cutting that off because, like I said, you do have that one time where you're like, oh, yeah, I'll get a hold of you. We'll talk here, we'll talk then. I didn't hear from probably really anybody after that. And it was tough because not having anything like that, you, you lose a lot of your support system. Um, and then you really have to rely on family, friends, relationships, which for a lot of people and myself, you're relying on a relationship that was new. Um, and she didn't understand the military really at all. Um, so you couldn't really have those conversations and it is difficult. It is still difficult to this day. Um, cause obviously I don't talk very much and that's odd because I do a podcast and everything else. And I tend to talk not as much as some say, um, but I do, do find it difficult to talk and, you know, obviously we're getting tons of arguments about it, but 
trying to be open and honest about everything that's going on or just talk about what's what you're feeling being being military it's tough because you can't just talk to really anybody because they don't understand um and it's not it's not their fault it's just the fact that you can't open up about some stuff that you've seen done you know with somebody because they're gonna you're gonna feel judged or there's flat i'm not gonna understand um because going through the stuff that you went through is very traumatic, traumatizing, life-changing, um, mind-altering at the same time. Um, but talking about it with somebody um, is, is one big thing to do. Uh, I've, and it wasn't until probably, shit, probably last few years that Lane and I started talking again. We started talking about some stuff. And then obviously say we've talked um, – We've talked off the podcast, even on the podcast, just about some stuff back and forth. Um, but it's it's one thing that I haven't talked to my family about it. They're not going to understand. Um, and that's that's one thing that I'm okay with not talking to them about it. But if you are struggling with it, don't be afraid to talk to somebody, uh, be it a, a counselor, you know, with, within your, the VA. Some people talk, talk trash about the VA. Yes, it does suck at times. Trying to get appointments does suck. Um, but if you do make the effort, a lot of times there is somebody to talk to, but if you're not getting that, take the effort to find somebody that you're, that you're close to, you can say, Hey, let me just talk. You don't have to talk back to me. Just let me talk. Don't judge me for what you hear. Just listen. And you'd be surprised, you know, you, you will feel better, but it's going to be, it's going to be awkward. And then once you start going, you know, it, it gets better. Uh, it took me a long time. I hit I hit a, a huge patch of depression when I was doing it, and I had to find something that really um, that I, that I liked, and I couldn't find. I was not I was not gonna take pills. I wasn't gonna take any medicine, nothing like that, because that's one thing the VA does. They throw pills at you. I didn't even take Tylenol, so there was no way I was gonna take any type of depression meds or anything else. I didn't want it. Didn't want to deal with that. I didn't want to have to rely on a, on a pill to make me feel better. So. Basically, I just had to find something to do to get my mind off stuff and kind of motivate me. So I went through everything and I found video games again. It had been many years since I had um, I played. And thankfully, by this time, that's when Warzone came out. It was right before COVID. And I, I, I got back into it. I found Warzone. I said, I found, I found Apex first. I hate this game. I found Apex first, got into that, and then thankfully Warzone came out. It was right around the same time, whenever I found it. I didn't know that Warzone was out, but I had found it um, a few months after it came out. And so I had gotten into that, and then I then I got into streaming right about when COVID did. So me and 50,000 other people got into um, streaming at the time as well. So I started doing that, and I really enjoyed it. going through and playing games for people to watch. Obviously, uh, starting out, I had zero people watching. It didn't matter to me because I know I was putting up fun stuff to watch for myself because I would go back and I watch, watch a lot of my play. So I could, I could watch myself getting better slightly because I was, I was, that was dog shit for the first year of playing that game. Um, cause I didn't play very often. Um, but man, I was just trying to get back into that and I somehow, some way found found people within the game that I was playing with, hanging out with um, almost nightly. These are just people that I had just come across uh, playing. And then at that point, I had shifted everything over to Facebook, social media, looking for um, groups. And I found a group that I'm not going to name. Nothing against them. I just don't. I'm not going to give them any accolades of any kind. Um, and within that group, I had found guys to play with. And this is also where I met Sig. So Sig and I had uh, went back and forth, and I was nominated for, I think it was Streamer of the Month. And at that time, they were doing, we've talked about this before, um, they were doing a interview for Streamer of the Month, and I was nominated and won. Did the interview, and then Sig was part of it, and somebody else. And weird, because I'd never been interviewed for anything like that. Um, went to the interview and then Sig had reached out to me and asked me if I wanted to be part of a, 
I want to say podcast, but it's more like a bunch of guys getting together and just talking, which is cool, whatever. You know, that's one thing to keep me invested in what I'm doing, and, you know, I enjoyed it. Um, but it was it was different because it wasn't like a weekly podcast, and none of it was invested to it. I didn't really enjoy it too much. I wanted to do a podcast, but I didn't know the first thing about doing it. Um, so I wanted to do it, but I couldn't find the time. Obviously, I had other things going on. So going back to everything, I took a uh, hiatus from streaming for a little while, kind of just stepped away because I had burned myself out the first year and a half. Um, and then I, I got back to it, and I had messaged Sig and said, hey, you know, let's do a podcast. So I know we talked about it a long time ago. I said, are you still interested? Are you still down to do it? Thankfully, he messaged back and said he was interested too. We needed to kind of talk and figure some things out. So figured that stuff out, and here we are, what, three seasons later? Almost three years? Two years? Something, whatever. But three seasons. And that's where we're at now with this. But it's been a it's been a crazy journey. And I know I've kind of probably bounced around a lot with with life. And um, I can't give you guys all, everything on the first night. Mm-hmm. You have to wait to, to get me undressed after the first date. So uh, going through everything, man, one thing I do want to iterate, reiterate is if you're struggling with stuff, coming out of the military, in the military, or just basic daily life, talk to somebody, reach out to somebody. Somebody will listen. Um, I, I do find it weird sometimes that people even ask on Facebook, but, you know, it is what it is. If that's what you need to do, um, get the help you need. Don't be afraid to do it. Things will get better. Life is difficult. Life's a bitch. We all know that. Um, but just don't be afraid to reach out and, and just ask for help. It's not it's not uh, it's not as hard as you think it is. Screw looking weak. Just get it figured out because end of the day you're wanted, you're needed somewhere, um, regardless of what you think. So different episode for sure. Maybe you like it, maybe you don't. Maybe we do another one, maybe we don't. Who knows? But uh, make sure you check us out every Thursday. Sig and I play. Occasionally, we have people pop on with us every now and then, but uh, we got one guy who's going through some stuff with his computer, so he's not able to play. Uh, another guy is hit or miss every few weeks, So, uh, but Sig and I are pretty consistent in playing now every Thursday, Warzone, for the most part. Uh, check out twoguysonegamepad.com for all the merch of anything you need, want, think of. We can do it. Um, also, check out Ring Rage Report podcast. That's our new podcast that is strictly just wrestling. So we will not be doing any wrestling on Two Guys One Game Pad anymore. All of our wrestling content will be over on Ring Rage Report podcast. Check it out. Like, review. If you don't like our takes on stuff or just want to talk, hang out, do whatever, let us know. Like I said, we're more than welcome. We're always welcoming to have anybody on the podcast um, to talk about anything. But also, another podcast is dropping soon. That is not Two Guys, One Game Head or Ring Rage Report. So stay tuned to social media. Hopefully that will come out. And, uh, yeah, check out Sig. Sig uh, streams every morning now for his Wake Up Gaming. I believe that's what it is, Wake Up Gaming, uh, from 6 to 8 a.m. Central Time. That's his thing now. He plays different games from Fortnite, Apex, Warzone, Boulder Skate, I think he's doing some, whatever the Hearts game is, with Mickey Mouse and Final Fantasy type, I don't know. It's not Final Fantasy because we don't like that game. Kingdom Hearts, that's what it is. Um, but yeah, and then Lane's doing his thing. You're probably going to see a little more of him. He's going to start popping on doing some things as well. Um, but yeah, check us out. Let us know. Great review. Our podcast for anywhere. You can get your own podcast. Till the next one. Bye, bitch.